But the last one, which was really the, the one that took me the longest to figure out, that was a mistake, was having a... Have you ever made mistakes that cost you something? Big snafus. Oh, wow, that, that's gonna hurt. That was a bad mistake. Well, I've made so many, and in fact, there were too many to put on this one video, so I'll make a whole series. But today, I wanna start with the chronological order of mistakes I made to get to the permaculture orchard. Stay tuned. Back almost 30 years ago, to get into this adventure of setting up this orchard, I made one big mistake, is that I got into orcharding and I didn't know anything. I was so green about growing fruit I remember asking the real estate agent, you said, uh, what's this, well, what's a rootstock? And he had to explain to me what a rootstock was. Today I think of that and I go, wow, I guess I learned along the way. Now that was a mistake. I could have learned, I could have sped up my learning if I had learned with somebody, if I had gone and apprenticed, if I had gone and interned, if I had taken courses on it. And although I look at it as a mistake that I didn't learn, I learned a lot, just not in that way. I learned basically by trial and error, which is the most costly way. If I look back, I think it was probably not a bad thing because I didn't have to unlearn. And I tell people today, it's so much easier if you're starting and you don't know, because I can teach you how to grow fruit and you don't have to unlearn what you already know. In fact, some of the hardest people to teach about this is people who already have an orchard because they know. They know how to do it. They know how to spray. They know how to fertilize. They know a lot of these things, but it's hard for them to unlearn. Start by educating yourself. Don't be paralyzed by the idea, oh, will I learn the right thing? Will I know what to do? Just start. I remember being at a crossroads. Okay, I should learn now because I've got this organic apple orchard i should learn how to spray or i could learn how not to have to spray sometimes you're at a crossroads yeah do i want to put my effort into learning how to spray or do i want to put my effort into learning how not to have to spray you can have points where learn yeah but learn not to is even better. Education is expensive for a reason. It costs a lot to make mistakes. Yeah, it costs a lot to learn from your mistakes. There's a reason why an education costs what it does, as long as it gets you to where you want to be without having to make a lot of those basic mistakes. So there's a cost to learning. Remember that. My ninth biggest mistake, which was about 22 years ago, I realized I should have started the nursery sooner. We grew up, we had our own nursery to replant, mainly because I didn't have the money to buy the trees to replant the permaculture orchard. But I should have started the nursery sooner. I had enough on my hands learning how to orchard. I was teaching at university at the time. To start the nursery on top of it was a little too much. And basically I was waiting for the right person to show up. And one of my students, Jean-Francois, he decided absolutely he wanted to have an orchard and the idea of having a nursery really appealed to him. So finally we got it done. Would have been great had it been done earlier because it would have been replanted earlier. When you start, you say, I'm not on a property. Get your nursery started ASAP. Even if you're in an apartment, start some bags of potting soil and start sticking cuttings into them. You can start wherever you are. I mentioned real estate agent not knowing about rootstock. Well, just to give you a little backstory on that, we decided, hey, this is a 4,000 tree conventional apple orchard for sale. Let's buy it. We bought it. I figured I don't want to grow conventionally. I don't want to have to spray all these synthetic pesticides. The first thing we did right away, transition to organic three years and then certified organic for a bunch of years. And then after I realized the organic monoculture apple orchard is not a great idea. It doesn't mean we don't spray. I thought we don't have to spray because it's organic. Well, that was a big mistake. I thought, you know what, since I don't want to do it as an organic monoculture orchard, I'll just convert it to a permaculture orchard. That was a big mistake because when you have an orchard, 
you can't just change the design of it just like that. It would have been far easier to have taken a blank field and started a permaculture orchard there. If you haven't started, don't buy an existing monoculture orchard because it's a lot harder. You have to undo what's there to redo something else. So we kept a little remnant of it just as a reminder of what it was like. But don't start with a monoculture orchard to become a permaculture orchard. Hey, in the end, having the organic monoculture orchard wasn't the end of the world. I learned what a rootstock was. I learned how to grow, or sort of learned how to grow apples anyway. I learned about orchards and, well, <laughs> I learned what organic meant and how to do things organically. It didn't really teach me about a permaculture orchard all that much. Yeah, it didn't. So when I say I much prefer a permaculture orchard even to a monoculture organic apple orchard, I know what I'm talking about. I've been there and I've done that and I don't want to go back. Around 2006 or 14 years ago, I realized, okay, we're going to replant from this monoculture apple orchard. We're going to replant to a permaculture orchard. And yes, we're going to tear out. So we kept a little bit. For a lot of the areas, we just tore everything out. Figure on start. Let's start from scratch. That was a big mistake and a costly one because we had an orchard that was producing something. And then we went to no orchard. Listen, I've made plenty of mistakes. Don't make that one. But at the time I thought well the only way to replace an existing orchard was to tear it out and replant. Yeah I remember two years later being in a course with a couple of people from France about pruning and they were talking about other subjects and the point of grafting and overgrafting. I didn't know that existed and when he said that in France they don't tear out orchards they just cut them and overgraft or top work a whole orchard to a different cultivar. I thought, wait a minute, are you telling me you can take even an older tree like this and not have to cut it down, but just overgraft it? Yeah, he said, they do it all the time. Oh my gosh, I had pulled out almost the whole orchard two years earlier and I realized, wow, I could have left even in trio system and go see that if you like the trio video. I could have kept one out of three trees as the apple tree. That was a very expensive lesson. So you can take part of an existing orchard and by overgrafting, transform that one to the same species, just different, more resist, disease resistant cultivars. Yeah, that, that lesson really hurt. Didn't it hurt? Yeah, it really hurt. You know, I went from having production to having nothing. That hurt. Don't make these mistakes that I made. I hope to save you them. The next one was about the nursery. And I'll do a whole separate video on the nursery because there were so many lessons we learned. But one of the most important lessons, and this was about 20 years ago, we started the nursery in 2002 or 18 years ago, tagging trees and identifying what you're grafting. So you see, normally when we do a nursery, we'll do several trees in rows. And the way we did it originally was we would put a tag at the beginning on the first tree we grafted. And if we did 10 grafts in the row, and then we'd put a tag of the next cultivar we would graft and so on and so on. It seemed like a good idea, except we had a rabbit come around and eat most everything off. So what would happen was we, if they ate it off, then we'd see these tags lying around on the ground. We didn't know where that cultivar had started and where it had stopped. It was a mess. It was a mess because that's the only record we had of what is what. Now what I suggest you do to properly identify is put a tag at the beginning. If you're only doing four or five trees, you could put a tag on every tree and identify it. So we use these aluminum tags. So this one is Nova Mac. We'll tag the beginning and then where it ends, I don't know where it ends, but it ends down there somewhere. We'll put a tag of Nova Mac and then whatever is the next one we're grafting, we'll 
tag the next tree. So if it's Nova Spy, we'll put Nova Spy and so on and so on. And then we'll make a quick little sketch. Doesn't have to be complicated, just a simple little diagram showing, okay, we did da -na 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 -na, 15 trees of Nova Mac and then 25 trees of Nova Spy and so on. And it was the middle row of three. So have a little plan and put a tag on the beginning and the end. We'll save you the grief of, I didn't know what they were and I therefore I didn't know where they should go. Properly tag and identify your trees, please. It will save you grief down the road. Around ooh, 2007 when we began replanting, finally, there's a bit of backstory again. We did the, the whole nursery, we had lots of trees and we lost the whole nursery twice. That was enough to want to quit. Well, one of the things I learned afterwards that I should have done that I didn't do was when a tree is ready, so here's the graft point. This is the growth from this year. This one grew and here it stopped last year. So this is a two year old tree. It's ready, two years, it's ready ready to go out in the orchard. Now, this year in the fall is the time to plant it. Don't leave your trees more than two years in the nursery because they're not getting better. You think, oh, they're gonna grow bigger. Well, they're getting a bigger root. They're harder to transplant. And the other thing is when you have all these young trees in a nursery, this is an incredible larder of food for a rabbit or for voles. I should have planted them in the fall when they were ready. Instead, during the winter, we lost the whole nursery twice. So take it from me, don't leave them. Hey, worst case, sell them. You say, I don't have a spot. Sell them. You can always buy other trees or you can always start another nursery, but don't just leave them because, well, I don't have a place to put them. I just finished saying, when it's time to plant the trees, it's time to plant them, right? Well, yes, <laughs> we had a lot of trees to plant. And so the focus was, let's get all the trees planted as quickly as possible. So we did it over three years. We put in three separate blocks. So we got a lot of trees planted, but that was a lot of work at the critical times for planting. What I realized the big mistake was it would have been far better had I planted less area, a smaller piece, but plant all of it. If you follow my ideas about trios, you know that the idea is to have three different trees in a trio, but also vertical trios. We have trees, and then we'll put a couple of shrubs. Here's a black currant, and here's a small gooseberry. And then the third part of that would be to have a layer of, here's some daylilies back here, to have about 10 to 16 perennials per tree. Well, that's a lot of plants. I focused all the attention on trees. And what happens is trees get going, they get bigger. And then when it came time to putting in shrubs, which was about four years later, the trees were pretty big. And so the shrubs were kind of in the shade to start, which is okay for things like gooseberry, but currants, they want some sun. Hascap, they want some sun. That was a mistake. Now I say plant a smaller area, but finish it, have it completely done. Partly because if you want propagating material, now you can have cuttings from your currants and cuttings from your gooseberries, and then you can expand with the plants and the cuttings that you already have. If you don't have them, you have to buy them. So that's a big lesson I learned because see here, we still don't have the perennials planted out because it's a lot of perennials. We put out almost 2000 trees times 16. Yeah, that's a lot of perennials to put out. We haven't finished that part. Since the beginning, one of the things that I've really made a mistake on is not having good record keeping. What do I mean? Well, how long did it take to harvest and how much did we harvest off of this Dolgo crab apple? I don't know. How long did it take to prune this tree? I don't know. Keeping good records is really important. It's not something I've been good at and so I don't keep good records. But keep simple records. If you have a tree and it takes you a while, okay, find out. How long did it take you to prune that tree? We go by row or block. How long did it take to prune this row? So if I say, well, yeah, 
This year, it was an hour to prune this row. Okay, keep that kind of records. Make those records easily retrievable. That is really important. With the idea down the road that you can establish, you know, what's your cost of production? The key to keeping good records is to have it simple, have it retrievable so you can use that information. I tried some years ago when it was a monoculture apple orchard. I figured I want to know how much it cost me. And when I calculated it all in the end, I realized that I was quite a bit under minimum wage for all the hours I'd put into it in a low year of production. So that's something that will be very easy for you to do a way better job than I do. Now here's a good one, a lesson I learned. Actually, I learned it the first year when we had our you pick orchard. People would come and they would go and pick and it was apples. So they would pick apples. This is crab apples but they would pick their apples and they'd come back and say, okay, we have our apples. What else do you have? I, well, we have this other kind of apple. No, no, we have enough apples. What else do you have? And I realized there that boy, oh boy, I'm missing out. If you, you pick and you have no diversity, you're missing out on a lot of opportunities. So when we finally got to the permaculture orchard many years later, I decided we're gonna have diversity. And I got so into planting a diversity that I forgot to plant the basics that people around here like. Even today, I still, see here, I got kiwi, I got grapes, there's a grape. We have hascap there, we have sorrel, we have aronia berry and goji berry and all these different things. And you know what? The most basic, like blueberry, raspberry, and strawberry, we don't even have. You can get fancy and get a lot of things, but make sure if those things that people like in your area, if they like them and they grow well on your site, make sure you have what you already know people want, because that's a no-brainer to grow and sell. So you can get fancy, but make sure you get back to basics. That's a lesson that stings because it takes a while to plant enough and to wait till they produce. So your planning and your design should be spot on for what people want. So the last point, not only should you grow what people want, but the last one, which is really the, the one that took me the longest to figure out, and I still haven't figured it out, that was a mistake, was having a good balance of crops. Balance in supply demand. We have way too many apples. Well, we started with apples and we kept putting a lot of apples. Yeah, the amount of apples you have in proportion, the balance between apples and pears, that's important. How many pears should you have for the amount of apples? How many plums should you have? Well, it may not be a, a question of per tree. It's a question of per production. So you got to do some sleuthing, have an idea of the average production per tree in your area for a pear tree and for a plum tree and for an apple tree. But that balance to help balance supply demand is kind of the last big mistake that I made. Because like I say, if you didn't get it right in the beginning, and you know what, you probably won't get it totally right, but I've got it quite a bit off. We never have enough pears. And actually we've had the first time enough plums last year. That balance is important, having the right balance. And if you say, well, I don't wanna have an orchard, I just wanna have a few fruit trees in my yard. Well, think of if it's just for you, what do you like most? But try to balance out what you want. If you say, I don't really care for apples, but you put three apple trees in a pear tree, that's not a good balance. Try to balance out your demand with your supply. And if other people pick it, or if you'll be selling, try to balance out supply and demand. Thanks for watching. Intrigued? Check out the virtual tour of the permaculture orchard. Have trees already? Pruningcourse.com. Subscribe, please. Check out some of the other videos or playlists. There's more to come. Stay tuned. Bye.